Our next presenter is Kelly Brandt, and she's a board-certified acute care nurse practitioner with Marshfield Clinic's Neurology Department. She specializes in management of movement disorders, including Parkinson's. As a nurse practitioner for the past nine years, she has a wide breadth of experience, including primary care, cardiology, and neurology. Welcome, Kelly. Good morning. I was all going to be on top of this, and then the world ended, and I didn't. So I will first like to say good morning. <laughs> okay. So real quick, nurse practitioners in neurology, my goal is for you to have a little bit better understanding of what nurse practitioners training looks like, and then a little bit more about our particular practice as well. And a question I get all the time, are you going to be a doctor someday? <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, the terminal degree for nurse practitioners is a doctorate of nurse practitioner. It is not, oops, am I not screening? It says I'm sharing. We have the slides up. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, I don't know what's going on. But if terminal degree, I'm sorry, is a doctorate of nurse practitioner, and I will not be a doctor. So I'm not sure. Okay, I am a nurse first. So the minimum entry to nursing is an associate's degree, although obtaining a minimum of a bachelor's is necessary before you get a master's degree. I went to UWM and got my bachelor's with a major in nursing. And once you graduate from a nursing program, then you have to take something called the NCLEX. I after I took my NCLEX, I worked in the ICU for three years prior to being an NP. Or actually, yeah. More schooling, more tests, masters, postmasters, and doctoral pro, uh, preparation and national board certification is required as an entry level for NPs. So I passed a national certification exam for the adult acute care nurse practitioner from the American Nurses Credentialing Center. You then take a exam from Wisconsin in order to get prescriptive authority, which is called the Advanced Practice Nurse Prescriber Exam. You have to get 85% right. And all of the laws, if you will, for NPs are in these chapters here, N7, N8, FAR 8, chapters 146 and 961. So when nurse practitioners graduate from school, they are prepared for entry level. We graduate with a base. We take our experience, our life experience, our educational experience, and then we grow and learn and develop competent skill and finesse. So every seven years, I have to renew my certification. And the requirements for that is continuing education. And informal education is absolutely necessary. So we kind of mix the art and science of medicine and your competence, my competence, and any nurse practitioner you will see, competence will change over time. Nurse practitioners are independent, kind of. So the language in Wisconsin states that an advanced practice nurse practitioner may order tests, treatment, therapeutics, appropriate to competence. So my competence in movement disorders is very different than my competence, say, as a GI per, uh, nurse practitioner would do. I just don't have the same knowledge base that someone in a different specialty would do. We are also required by law to have a collaborative relationship with a physician, and this must be in writing. And so I have a legally binding collaborative agreement with three physicians, one of whom is Dr. Spangler, 
uh, and they are there for a resource for me in the event that I find myself needing a resource. And I don't really think this is very different than physicians because physicians, when they have questions, they ask other physicians. So I also get a lot of questions about, can you do everything that a physician does? Kinda. Depending on my training, my competence, and the institution I work for, along with Medicare CMS guidelines, I can practice fairly independently. Recently, um, laws have been changed that I am now legally able to sign incapacitation paperwork and order home care. There was a time where the authority and the laws were much more restricted. Admittedly, this is a political and social hot topic. If you talk to my brother-in-law, you'll get a very different answer on the competence of NPs if, as if you talk to some other physicians. A question I often get, is it safe for me to see an NP? And studies for many, many years have consistently shown that NPs provide high quality care. We have a unique perspective. We have a ton of experience. Oh, more than 50 years of research have consistently demonstrated excellent outcomes and high quality of care are provided by NPs. And also have shown that NP care is comparable in quality to physicians. So here, I won't go through these slides very detailed, but there are many studies that are listed here that talk about can an NP get the proper diagnosis? Can they ask the right questions? I find this interesting. NPs are ask more questions and are un less likely to prescribe medication to patients. NPs provide service at a reduced cost which is important for the increased cost of healthcare in America. We do very well at adhering to medical guidelines and we have good outcomes. So this is our practice and I can already hear from the other room, Dr. Spangler's cringing. <laughs> but on the far left is my medical assistant, Penny. And then me, of course, Dr. Spangler and Dr. Spangler's nurse, Ariana. And we work very, very closely together to provide good service. So my practice, I would like to say, is the best of both worlds. I have my own panel of patients, and those are patients that might see me and not ever see a neurologist. So they'll see me for their tremor or movement disorder. I also have a lot of general neurology patients, so migraines, dementia, other diagnoses. And then I have my panel of patients that I really team with Dr. Spangler. So patients that are co-managed. So maybe they'll see me and then they'll see Dr. Spangler and by, you know, back and forth for the duration of their lifetime. And this is a really unique opportunity for our patients to really make sure that they're getting taken care of frequently, that we're keeping a close eye on each other. It's always a disadvantage to a provider to come in blind to a situation. So if we both kind of keep a pulse on how people are doing, we really can then head off any problems. And also, if a problem does arise, we're not coming in blind. We're not coming in cold. We have a good basis of what the, a person's baseline is or how they usually look so that when they come in with a problem, we can say, oh, yeah, this is definitely different. And it really helps us as helps me as a provider. And I think Dr. Spangler would agree with me on that one. So we have a fantastic team. If 
any of the four of us have the audacity to take a vacation or get sick, uh, we also have a, a wonderful department that supports us and there's always someone on call and there's always someone here to answer any questions you may have. So I think you can hold your questions to the end of the next slideshow, but if you have any questions about the role of an NP, please let me know. I do also want to just say that in since I've been an NP, I graduated with my master's in 2011, I've had several roles and every role has been different. Some roles have been more tied into teamwork and really a collaborative practice with physicians. I've been in other roles where I don't even see a physician. Um, so every role is different. So my role, I, again, I have the best working relationship ever, but every NP and every NP role may look a little bit differently, but it's good to know what our baseline is in terms of what our basic education requirements are. So I will move on to the next presentation, I hope. And I will try to pull up my next slideshow. Okay, Parkinson's disease, medications to manage motor symptoms. Parkinson's disease, again, is a movement disorder. The part of the brain responsible for planning and executing movement is diseased. It loses its ability to make, store, and transport a chemical messenger called dopamine. As a result, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease will gradually develop, and they tend to become more severe over time. We don't have all of the answers on why these neurons stop working correctly. The symptoms of the disease that affect movement are called the motor symptoms, and other symptoms are called non-motor symptoms or not related to being able to move, which Dr. Spangler just covered in her lecture. I make this very simple. There are other motor symptoms, but the very simply, Stiff, slow, tremor, and gait instability or balance issues. Non-motor symptoms, again, you're probably very familiar with these from Dr. Spangler's lecture, but everything from constipation to mood changes, acting out your dreams, memory and cognition changes, drooling, and others. I like to say it's all about the dopamine everything in moderation, how to get it and how to keep it. So with Parkinson's disease, we have to lose about 80% of our dopamine before we even notice that there's something wrong. So we're already way down by the time we start to manifest symptoms. Dopamine is actually quite complex. It's both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. In the brain, it's released in order to send messages to other nerve cells, and this helps manage motivation and reward type behavior, as well as what I'm gonna talk about more, which is motor function. Outside of the brain, Dopamine is involved in blood pressure regulation and GI motility, and that can also play a role in the symptoms of the disease. So there are several classes of medications we use to manage Parkinson's disease. We can, and I tr like to separate these things as we can either get dopamine or we can keep dopamine. So on the left, you'll see the classes of medications we use to get dopamine in. And then on the far right, the medication classes we use to keep it around longer. And then the next on the bottom right there, also we want to avoid meds that block dopamine. So a lot of psychiatric medications we see 
can actually cause like a pseudo Parkinsonism where you the medication itself is actually blocking your body's natural dopamine. And if you have Parkinson disease and already don't have enough, you don't want to get take a medication that might block more. So other classes are kind of oddball classes, uh, amantadine and anticholinergics, and we'll go through that as well. Classes of medications, I'll start with the dopamine agonists. Again, this is going to getting dopamine. Dopamine agonists will mimic the action of dopamine as a messenger. This, These are medications that also can be very helpful with restless legs. And we do have both immediate and extended release formulations available of these. Dopamine agonists are listed as follows. I highlighted or made a little bigger the ones that our practice uses most often. Pramipexol, branded Mirapex, Ropinarol, branded Requip, and Rotigotine, branded Nupro. There are some others as well. Dopamine agonists are all in the same family, but they're not the same. Each has a different affinity or attraction to different types of dopamine receptors, and they have different half-lives, which means they last different amounts of time. What I like about dopamine agonists is that they have reduced chance of dyskinesias or abnormal movements, and the absorption is not affected by your diet. So you can take these out. Um, without regard for when you're eating. The bad is that you have to titrate up slowly. And if you have a side effect that you need to come off and you're on a big enough dose, we would need to wean you off. And there are higher chances of orthostatic symptoms like getting dizzy when you stand up, et cetera. Potential side effects uh, commonly seen, swelling in the legs, sleepiness, or even sleep attacks where you'll just fall asleep out of nowhere. Impulse control disorders, um, this is rare, but if it happens, it's a big deal. So if you're spending all your money on shopping or gambling or you know, pornography addiction, then that's not a good thing, and we should probably get you off of this drug. Another thing we do see is confusion or hallucinations. So people, if you're seeing blue elephants um, and this is a drug you're on, maybe we want to back you off of this medication. We can work around or cope with side effects. We can change the drug, we can change the dose, we can change timing, or we can do things like elevating your legs or wearing compression stockings. Why don't we just take dopamine? Well, dopamine can't get to the brain without someone carrying it there. And without getting too complex into pharmacology, we use something called levodopa, and levodopa is a precursor to dopamine, and it is our most direct way to get dopamine to the brain. The carbidopa is added to the levodopa to slow down the enzyme that converts it so that more levodopa gets to the brain. That allows us to use much lower doses of levodopa and still get the same benefit. I don't know if you've seen the movie with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, um, I think it's called The Awakening, where they, they give levodopa to these basically catatonic patients and they wake up. So, uh, but then people got side effects from such massive doses of levodopa. Levodopa in the gut can cause nausea and dizziness. Levodopa in the brain, improved function. So that carbidopa really is helpful for us. So carbidopa, levodopa is not one thing. It's many things. We have immediate release, delayed release, lower and higher ratios of carbidopa to levodopa. We have combination pills of immediate and controlled release. And so... It's not one entity. So if you have a side effect from carbidopa levodopa, talk to us because we, we very well be able to mitigate that or, or adjust. Um, our practice, we tend to go with the immediate release first um, in terms of uh, which formulation we use. It gives us a good upkick and uh, people feel, people tend to do pretty well on it. 
it lasts about four to five hours and then it's gone, which is troublesome in the sense that you really have to take it every four to five hours. Maybe not initially, but as the disease progressive progresses, you may notice that it wear, wears off. There's a widespread misno misnotion, is that a thing? Anyway, <laughs> with um, that levodopa will stop working and levodopa does not stop working. Again, this is a precursor drug to dopamine. It gets levodopa into the brain, which gets broken down to dopamine and acts. However, your disease will get worse. And if you have less dopamine receptors, you have less places for that levodopa to go. Potential side effects we see with carbidopa, levodopa are nausea, dizziness, lightheadedness, dry mouth, dry eye. Some of our workarounds, we can take it with food, which slows the absorption. We again could change the ratio of carbidopa to levodopa. We could use re-wetting drops for that dry eye and biotine mouthwash is helpful sometimes for that dry mouth. And just a side note, like anything, we really can get too wet and too dry. So you might be drooling but have a dry mouth or your eyes might be watering but you're, they're dry at the same time. So uh, if you ever have symptoms, please just talk to us and we'll navigate them. Long-term use of levodopa is associated with dyskinesias, which is, are those extra involuntary movements. Sometimes people will move their head or they'll shake, or some people have dystonic dyskinesias where they'll twist or, or get um, stiff. Um, most people by 10 years of therapy will develop some sort of dyskinesia. And when to actually start this drug is a shared decision between you and your provider. So from my standpoint, we consider your age, where you're at in your disease, how you're tolerating the medication, and also your and our preference. So we can get creative with levodopa. Uh, advanced strategy, level off the roller coaster. So there is a medication that came out um, more recently uh, called Ryteri, and this is manufactured with tiny little beads that release the carbidopa and levodopa at different speeds. It's designed to provide that initial rapid absorption of levodopa that gives you that kick in and but also provide some more stable levodopa concentrations over the course of the uh, over the course of the day with reduced peaks and troughs it, but it is not a one to one switchover so if you're on carbidopa levodopa now and you're having motor fluctuations and we switch you over to riteri mo at least half of the people will require some some adjusting of the doses Duopa is also an option. This is uh, one of those advanced surgical options. It's actually a gel form of levodopa, and we administer it directly into the small intestine. It does require a tube in your belly, uh, but it can be helpful for those people that really have a lot of fluctuations with their levodopa uh, absorption. Or if your gut is not helping us, we can bypass the gut altogether. So there are, these are kind of the new medications. Imbresia was improved in December of 18, and this is an actually an inhaled form of levodopa. We can use it five times a day, and it can help people that have wearing off that can kick in fast. We can't use it if you have asthma or COPD, and sometimes people cough. And this is probably the uh, most common reason I have seen personally for people discontinuing Embresia. So getting back to the classes of the medications, we talked about the dopamine agonists and levodopa. Now we'll kind of go on to the other side and we can keep the levodopa or the carb, uh, dopamine around longer. So one class is the COMPT inhibitors. So we want to hold on to that dopamine. So once we get it in the brain, we want to keep it there. Our bodies are made to recycle. So dopamine is broken down 
in our bodies by two enzymes. So we have two classes of medications that target the enzymes that break the dopamine down. If we inhibit that enzyme, we'll break down the supply slower and more dopamine, dopamine will stay attached to the receptors. So the COMP inhibitors stop the enzyme catecholomethyltransferase, and you will never see that on a test. But the one we typically use is Enticapone, which is branded COMTAN, or you might have heard of Stilevo, which is a combination pill of the Enticapone and the Carbidopa levodopa. And we used to have Tolcapone, but that was taken off the market in the US due to concerns of liver toxicity. And to Capone, the goal is to improve on time. And on time, again, for review, is the time when your motor symptoms are managed effectively. Typically, enticapone is our go-to when carbidopa levodopa is wearing off before the next dose is due, or if we need a bit of a boost, but we don't want to increase the levodopa dose. Side effects, it does color your urine. And that can be <laughs> disturbing, especially if you weren't prepared for it. And nausea and vomiting or diarrhea can occur in up to 1 in 10. If you're on carbidopa levodopa and we add enticapone, you may have some peak dose dyskinesias. So uh, we may actually overshoot that therapeutic window and we may need a little bit of adjustments. Again, the other class of medications, uh, which is an enzyme inhibitor, are the MAOIBs. And these inhibit the enzyme monoamine oxidase type B. And what this does, again, is help you maintain on time longer. It can cause insomnia or bad dreams, so we have to keep an eye out for that. The drugs in this class that we use are risagiline and selegiline. Risagiline is dosed once a day, selegiline is dosed twice a day, and there's a new synthetic option uh, called safinamide. I'm blanking on the brand name of that, but that is out there as well. Last class I'll discuss is amantadine, and amantadine is kind of a uh, of a mystery. The exact mechanism of why it works for Parkinson's disease is not fully understood, but the, it can help a lot with tremor. So we typically use it early in disease for those uh, folks that are very tremor dominant. And then more later in disease, we can use it for dyskinesias. It is our one drug uh, that is used to treat dyskinesias. So we have amantadine, which is the short acting, and then the branded uh, amantadine, which is Gocovery, and that is a longer acting formulation. This too can cause dry mouth, urinary retention, hallucinations, and confusion. So all of these dopaminergics can cause uh, these things. So we have to watch it and then work with us to help see maybe what the cause is and how we can get rid of it. New approved as of August of last year is a new drug called Istradefeniline. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> so this is an adenosine A2A receptor antagonist. It is used along with levodopa to improve on time and it's been used in Japan for about seven years, um, only approved in the US, again, less than a year ago. The FDA held off because they wanted more efficacy data prior to approving it. There is another drug in this same class in phase two trials. A phase two trial is where they study safety, and that trial is listed there. Another strategy we have is bypassing the gut altogether. Again, we uh, similar to Embresia, where we had the inhaled levodopa, we have apomorphine or apokin, which is subcutaneous, a shot in the belly. This is nice because it, it does have rapid onset within 10 minutes, but we can get significant nausea and vomiting. So we, uh, the first time you take it, typically you would need a pre-medication. 
Anything on the horizon, uh, of course. Um, apomorphine infusion pumps are approved in Europe, and there is potential that the FDA would approve it here in the future. The goal, again, would be to improve your on time and reduce your off time. So if you're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, where do we start? This is the million dollar question. There is no expert consensus on this, and this really has to be a collaborative decision between your provider and your, you and your family. So factors include age. So if you're older, we tend to go with the levodopa first. If you're younger, we might wanna hold off on the levodopa. Um, what your personality framework is. Maybe we wanna avoid uh, a dopamine agonist in somebody who already has gambling issues. What support systems do you have? Um, is there someone around to help you manage medications? What will your insurance cover? Which is the thing that drives me crazy, but it's a reality in our current world. And the prior history of what medications you've been on uh, be uh, before. Are you a person that tends to tolerate medications? Are you a person that tends to have bad side effects to medication? So there really is no right answer. And unfortunately, at this stage in the game, I don't have a genetic test I can do that says, oh, you should take Pramipexol or you should take Rapinarol. So I don't know which one's going to work best for you. So it, it, the plan has to be dynamic. Um, but I also think it's really important to state that there really is no wrong answer. So if someone, if uh, uh, another neurologist starts you on carbidopa, levodopa, or someone else recommends amantadine, or someone else recommends um, uh, risagiline, it's probably not wrong. So this is kind of a busy slide, but this is a quick and dirty what to do when. So if the MAOIBs, again, that's trying to keep the medication around longer, have mild to modest benefit, but again, uh, if they don't have a therapeutic response, we can add levodopa, we could, ink if they're, and still not having therapeutic response, we could add a dopamine agonist, but we might have to go down on the levodopa. If they're discon if you get dyskinetic, we could reduce your levodopa dose or add a dopamine agonist. Uh, we could add amantadine. We could reduce the dose. Anyway, this is very complex, but these are kind of some of the things that are racing through my head when a person um, is telling me about their symptoms. Parkinson's disease does get worse. Um, so experts matter. So I'm really, really lucky to have Dr. Spangler and myself here in central Wisconsin. And we really can help you navigate virtually any problem. We start to think, do we need more dopamine? Do we need less? Do we need more consistent levels? And this is really where art meets the science of medicine. When we deal with motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, off periods, rapid offs, freezing, dystonia, akesthesia, and diphasic dyskinesias. So those are all really fancy words, but we really are prepared and ready to help you navigate whatever symptoms you're having. Early in PD, we could use levodopa, a dopamine agonist, risagiline. If you're starting to wear off, we could try some of these tips. If you're getting dyskinetic, we could try some of these ideas. If you're freezing, we could try some of these ideas. And you can review that at your convenience. <laughs> so we do have our advanced techniques. Um, pumps, again, those, uh, the Duopa pumps, the apomorphine pumps. DBS has been around for a very long time and that's content for a whole nother lecture. Focused ultrasound gives you a permanent lesion to the brain. And we do have those rescue medications like Embresia and Apokin. So 
I think it's important that you as a patient or a care partner help us help you. So we need to, number one, identify the symptom. Are you stiff? Are you slow? Are you having tremor or balance problems? Are you having any side effects? Are you confused, nauseated, swollen? And then also think critically about the timing. Is Are these side effects happening after your medications, before your medications, with meals, without meals, if you ate something specific, um, how are you doing during sleep? What else is going on? Are you sick? Are you tired? Are you stressed? Or is it not related to your Parkinson's disease at all? And I think Dr. Spangler touched on this as well, that not all constipation is related to Parkinson's disease. You might actually have a bowel problem. And diarrhea. Um, diarrhea is a common side effect of some of the medications we use, but maybe you have some inflammatory bowel issue. So we always want to rule out other things. So we do have multiple classes of medications, but at the most basic level, it's about the dopamine. We either want to put it in, pretend we're dopamine, or slow down the breakdown of dopamine. And our newest drug options offer different administration methods. Um, so it could be IV, sub-Q, inhaled, but the principle is the same. We want to get dopamine into the brain where we don't have enough of it. So surgical options are available, including focused ultrasound and deep brain stimulation. And thankfully, there is ongoing research which offer, offers us hope for novel strategies. Parkinson's disease is incurable, but it is not terminal. It is caused by loss of dopamine in the brain, and that leads to messaging problems. We move too much and too little at the same time. So that gets complex pathophysiology, but uh, dopamine is important for us. And the medications we use for this disease, uh, treating the motor symptoms, can help augment your brain chemistry and really tip the scales in our favor. Medications uh, adjustments will be needed. Your disease will get uh, change over time and medications will need to be changed over time. Again, everyone is unique. And as Dr. Spangler said, there are different flavors. So everybody's disease is going to be different and everyone's response to medications will be different. But please know that you are an important player in helping us manage your disease. Your life matters now with Parkinson's as much as it did before Parkinson's. Stay hopeful as you navigate adversity and stay you in spite of your Parkinson's from Frank Church. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Kelly. Great job. Um, way to deal with the technical difficulties and keep us right on time. I appreciate that. <laughs> So we have a handful of questions that have been submitted. Um, one of the questions Gary and Barbara asked was, how do you determine if it's lightheaded or dizziness associated with Parkinson's disease versus potential cardiac issues? Yeah, absolutely. I think we always need to rule out other issues. So if somebody is, started a medication yesterday, they took their first dose and they got really dizzy, maybe it's a little more clear. But if you're getting dizzy when you stand up or if you're getting lightheaded when you're doing the dishes, uh, it may behoove us to get a really, really good history of when it's happening, how it's happening, et cetera. But also we, we may just have to send you to the cardiologist to do a heart monitor, do a, a heart ultrasound, and really make sure that it's not a cardiac issue. Thank you. Um, one of the questions Raymond asked was, um, and I got to make sure I'm reading the right one. Um, how do you determine if you have dry mouth, whether or not you have chronic drooling or not associated with Parkinson's disease? Oh, sure. So um, Parkinson is classically too much, too little, right? So you're, you're shaking, but at the same time, you can't move. You might be drooling. If you're, if you're drooling, you probably notice there's drool coming down your face. And um, 
if you wake up and your mouth feels like chalk, then you probably have a dry mouth. But uh, so it's really it's really symptomatic. But I guess I guess my question for Raymond would be, what what is the concern? So um, uh, if your dry mouth, we can use those biotin. Uh, mouthwashes and if uh, drooling uh, we do have some treatments for drooling as well including we can put drops under the tongue or even do botox under the tongue to help reduce drooling okay. um, i hope that answers Raymond had a question. Second question which was more um I, I have chronic or excessive tearing in spite of, you know, I'm using eye drops, are there any other things we can do to help with that excessive um, tearing? Yeah, so tearing is an interesting phenomenon, and it, I think it has to do with, again, that blinking. So the tear duct will secrete the tear, and then you're supposed to blink, and then your eye will spread that tear across your eyeball. So if you're not blinking as much as normal, then you may have that tear just run right down your face. So it's kind of hard to blink more because it's such an automatic thing. But oftentimes if we control you, uh, or adjust medications, we can help that tearing. Um, in terms of uh, medications to stop the tearing. Typically, we don't want to dry up your eyes because then you have dry eye. <laughs> so there are uh, some people. Um, oh, good. Sorry. Yeah. Well, there are some people that have more of those type, auto, what we call autonomic non-motor symptoms. So the tearing, the drooling, the dizziness, the, all of those sweating, those things that happen automatically in our body can be more affected in some than in others. All right. Well, thank one more question I had um, was from John, which I think maybe goes along with this, but I'm not, I'm not sure. So that's why I'm going to ask it. Um, is dripping from the nose or running nose, is that a common Parkinson's symptom? And what can I do for it if it is? <laughs> it is common and it's tough. Um, so again, that autonomic bucket um, is a really tricky uh, topic. All of these uh, functions that occur automatically. I think if your nose is running, and you've never had any sinus problems ever, it might just be from your Parkinson's disease. But again, as always, we wanna make sure that there's not something, you know, a, a lesion in your nose or some other source of your nose being dripping. But I do see it very commonly, um, uh, the dripping of the nose, and it fits into that autonomic bucket. Well, and I'm sure it's reassuring to anybody watching who has drippy nose in the in the age of COVID that it may be a <laughs> Parkinson's issue and they can tell people that. Right. Yep, absolutely. Um, if you're, you know, same with sweating. You might sweat too much. You might sweat not enough. So, it, but it does, it does occur commonly. Um, and then the last question, which somebody actually posted via Facebook for us, um, which I, th I think it's kind of a, a really tough question, but I'll put it out there because I don't know if there's a right answer. Um, she asked, what is your favorite drug to deal with on and off times or wearing off? She said she's using Carvedopa, Levodopa. She's also taking Ritari, but she's still having some of those wearing off. So what drugs do you maybe use or recommend they should ask, be asking about? Yeah, um, I think that's an excellent question and there really is no right answer. So I would encourage this person to talk to their provider about their wearing off symptoms. So it sounds like she's taking Carbidopa, Levodopa and Ritari, which is Carbidopa, Levodopa. So again, if we go back to that concept of get it in or keeping it around longer, and if she's having some motor fluctuations, maybe something like Enticapone or Rosagiline might be beneficial. Some people are just, they ride the roller coaster. So some people, um, no matter what we do, we might need to shift uh, the way we get it in. So we can consider some of those injectable, um, like Apikin or Imbresia, or sometimes even uh, brain stimulation can be really helpful for those people. Um, 
we could also put the levodopa into the gut um, with duopa. So um, in terms of motor fluctuations, if you're wearing off before the next dose, we, we can try the Retari, which has a little bit of a immediate release and a, a more extended release uh, beads of levodopa and carbidopa, or we can try to keep it around longer with those COMPT inhibitors and, or those MAOIs. Perfect answer. Thank you so much, um, Kelly. I really appreciate it. I'm going to thank you. Uh, we get so many questions about what does a nurse practitioner do, and that's why I asked you to talk about that at the beginning, and hopefully you answered some of the questions about who a nurse practitioner is, what you can do in a clinic, um, and hopefully takes away some of the misconceptions of what you can and can't do, so I appreciate you doing that. Um, and then your last answer, all the medications you touched on, we have vendors who have those drugs. So during our break now, we have until about 11 o'clock. Um, please go visit those vendors, ask some of those questions about the drugs Kelly just mentioned. Um, so Kelly, from me and everybody listening, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, and we'll have everybody back here at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. Have a good day.